Hello, everyone. Welcome to another uh, Word for the Moment video blog. I want to continue with uh, the general theme that I have been on for the last several blogs, and that is Hebrews 6, 5, the tasting of the good Word of God and the powers of the age to come. One of the things that I have often mentioned that I really enjoy is getting emails from people. I especially enjoy reading the emails from people in other countries. We get a lot from New Zealand and Australia, uh, Japan, uh, and also Africa. I've had several pastors write to me from Kenya and Nigeria uh, that they watch the blogs and they then go and preach the, the blogs to to their people, which is really encouraging to me. Which, by the way, thank you to all of you that help, that give so that we can do these things free and uh, people all over the world can watch them. But over the last couple of months, I've just, I read all the emails that come in. I can't respond to all of them. I'm gonna make more of an effort to respond, even if it's a couple of sentences. But, but I, I, I've been getting some emails, people have asked questions, and, and this blog is gonna be somewhat dedicated to addressing one or two of the questions that have come in as I have been teaching on the tasting of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Believe it or not, you know, some people very sincerely have written to me and asked biblically how we have the faith to believe that the last day generation is going to be a generation of revelation, that we can have the expectation of going behind the veil, as did Paul, as did John, to receive supernatural insights into the scriptures. I've had a couple of people write to me and say, well, the reason Paul and John had those experiences was because they got the revelation to write the scriptures. Now that we have the scriptures, uh, is that kind of revelation necessary? Those have been a couple of the sincere questions. One or two wrote a little less sincere, a little critical, thinking that you know we have the scriptures, why do we need to have supernatural revelation? Well, I'm going to address that in this issue of, uh, of the Word for the Moment blog. I'm going to address what I believe the Bible teaches about the last days. And I'll just say up front, you know, my main point, that, that what I believe the Scripture teaches is that the last days will be the greatest revelation. That there will be more revelation. Joel 2 teaches us that in the last days I'll pour out my Spirit upon all mankind. Your sons and daughters will see visions and old men will dream dreams and you'll prophesy. Everyone's going to be prophetic. I believe that. I believe the scriptures teach that. There are many other places. You know, I, one of the things I want to kind of build from, and this one is from Matthew chapter 13, where Jesus gives the parable of the wheat and the tares. You know, he says that he himself, as he is interpreting this parable, he was the one that sowed the wheat. He defines the wheat as the sons of the kingdom. The devil is the one who sowed tares. Tares are a counterfeit form of Christianity. The Bible teaches that plainly. But he goes on to say that the harvest is the end of the age. And at the end of the age, there will be a separation of the wheat and the tares. And this is what it says about the sons of the kingdom, verse 43 of Matthew 13. Then the righteous will shine as the sun in the kingdom of our Father. The end of the age, there's to be a body of people that are illuminated, that shine like the brightness of the sun because they have come to a place of maturity. I believe Isaiah chapter 60 teaches the same thing. He's prophesying about the end of the age. I believe everyone sees Isaiah 60 as an end of the age scripture where darkness is covering the earth and deep darkness the people. But in the midst of that, there's a glory illuminated body of people. It tells us in verse 5 of Isaiah 60, they will see something and become radiant and their heart will tremble and be enlarged. The word see there is by prophetic vision, by revelatory insight. You'll see and what you see will make you become radiant. As it says here in Matthew 13, you're going to shine like the brightness of the sun. Uh, Daniel 12, a very consistent passage with that same theme. Daniel says, in the last days, there will be revelations. He saw a revelation. Gabriel brought it to him. He was caught away in ecstatic vision. He was raptured, if you will. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. He was caught away in ecstatic vision. Gabriel gives him revelation, but Gabriel says, 
This revelation will be sealed until the last days. Daniel 12, 4 and Daniel 12, 9 tells us plainly that there will be supernatural revelation. There are insights, mysteries, revelations that will be reserved for the end of the age because it's going to mobilize the people. It's going to make them be illuminated. It says it right there in Daniel 12. Read the entire passage. Many will have insight and many will go back and forth and those that have insight will shine like the brightness of the expanse of heaven and lead many to righteousness. So we're getting the idea the Lord is desiring to illuminate a body of people. And that illumination will be like an evangelistic tool leading people right to the Messiah. Not only that, we're told that there are great mysteries yet to be revealed. So my belief is the scriptures tell us teach us that the end of the age will be the age of the greatest revelation, that Paul and John are just prototypes, that what they experienced as they were caught away in the Spirit is only a model for you and I to follow in the last days. The glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. I love what Peter said. He said that the Scriptures are not a matter of private interpretation. I don't want an opinion of the Scriptures. I want a revelation of the Scriptures. I don't even like my own opinion. <laughs> I want the Lord to reveal the scriptures. The scriptures are not a matter of private interpretation. But men of old were moved by the Holy Ghost and spoke from God. We have great insight and we're not going to learn this. The great insight that is coming and we're not going to learn it in commentaries because the model for the things to come will not be found in the past but only in the future. And it says in, in Zechariah chapter 4 that when the capstone comes, the end of the age, the culmination, the great consummation of everything will come with shouts of grace, grace. You know, I know one of the arguments that I have received in emails, people are saying, well, Paul had great revelation because of the difficulty of his day. Because they lived in a time of Roman persecution and oppression and etc., martyrdom and such as that was going on and because of that they needed to be supernatural. Well, that very same apostle, Paul, also wrote to his spiritual son Timothy and said, if you think those days are bad, he said, wait till you see the last days. He prophesied that the end of the age will be even darker, even more difficult than his own age. So by that argument, we need more of the supernatural than even they needed in the early church. I know many of you already believe that. But I want to just address over the next couple of blogs some of the stumbling blocks. That's what it says here in Matthew 13, that he'll send hosts of heaven to remove stumbling blocks. And I want to begin to try to change the mindset of a big portion of the church. The mindset being that the first church age, the apostolic age, was the greatest age. I believe the exact opposite is what the Bible teaches, that the last age will be the greatest age. The glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. It's the nature of God. You read about the nature of God. It says in Romans 1, we understand His invisible attributes. We understand His divine nature, His eternal power by what He has created. And what He has created is ever expanding, always increasing. He doesn't start out with a big bang and then whimper out. He starts out with a big bang and it goes out with a bigger bang. He has greater power, greater demonstration. He is going to demonstrate the power of His blood before the end of the age comes. Matthew, I mean, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 4. We haven't really taught Ephesians 4 the way we need to. I know that we have the whole teachings about apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. We need them. Clearly we need them. I've taught apostolic reformation for years. But if you continue on in that passage, it says we will have apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers until. Then there's life on the other side of until. There's something that happens on the other side of until. Three things. The unity of the faith. Coming to the knowledge of the true knowledge. The true knowledge. Look at the Greek word there. The true knowledge of Christ. There is a knowledge out there that's not based in truth. But the true knowledge of Christ. And then the next one, which is almost unfathomable to become a mature man to the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. That there will be a body of people, read that very carefully, study that out for yourself. There will be a mature people on planet earth and the measure, the stature of, of their walk with God will be to the fullness of Christ. To the measure of the fullness that belongs to Christ. 
That seems unfathomable, that we can have a walk that, it, that He is our model, but yet that is what the Scriptures say. There's power in the blood. That's how we do that. I know the question you're asking, how could that even be conceivable? How is that possible? Because we are adopted by the seed of God. Romans chapter 8, you know, it's often quoted. Romans 8, 19 says that uh, you know, there, uh, the earnest expectation, there is an expectation of all creation for the manifestation of the mature sons of God, those that are spoken of over in Ephesians 4. Tells us over in verse 22 that all of creation is groaning unto the childbirth, groaning with, with the pains of childbirth to the birthing of the mature sons. In verse 23, Paul says, even we ourselves are groaning within ourselves. What For what? The adoption of sons, those that have the first fruits of the Spirit. This is what I've taught often. Romans 8, 23 is not about becoming a Christian. It's about people that are already Christians, people that already have the first fruits of the Spirit that have something inside of them that has been awakened. You're groaning. You're longing. You're hungering. Something on the inside says there's more. There's more to this life. There's more to the gospel. There's more to the supernatural walk with God. We feel something inside of ourselves compelling us from where we are into someplace else. I love what it says in Haggai chapter 1 because I believe it's descriptive of where we are. It says, The Spirit of the Lord stirred up the heart of Zerubbabel, the governor. The Spirit of the Lord stirred up the heart of Joshua, the high priest. And the Spirit of the Lord stirred up the remnant of His people. What you might say is they're groaning. What does it mean when the Spirit stirs us up? It means that we're not sure where we're going, but we're not staying where we are. We're on the move. And I believe that's what Romans 8 is about. We're groaning. We're longing. We're compelled. We're drawn into something. What are we being drawn into? The mature man. A, a supernatural guy. It has to be a supernatural gospel. I am relooking at the life of Paul. He was caught away in the Spirit and saw things he didn't even have the ability to articulate. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I don't believe it was something that he was not permitted to say. He just didn't have the ability. I, you know, we're beginning to see some of this. There are things that are so fantastic, you just don't have words. When I was caught away, you know, and on the day of my surgery, I struggled to find language to articulate what I experienced. It was something on the other side of the veil. It was something you're caught away, you're wrapped. I remember, you know, Bob Jones used to always, you know, whenever he would hear someone teach rapture, you know, we teach, well, there's going to be a rapture at the end of the age, you know, the bride of Christ. And I believe that. I believe in the catching away. I want to be clear about that. But Bob says, I get raptured every day. And, you know, and he did. <laughs> he got caught away in the Spirit almost every day. And I think I am feeling this groaning within myself that Paul spoke of in Romans 8, 23, this longing to be wrapped every day, to be caught away in ecstatic vision. That's what happened to John on the island of Patmos. That's what happened to Paul when he was caught away multiple times. He was caught away, he was in the realm of the Spirit when the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus. The two realms merged together. Paul said, I received my gospel not by the teaching of men or by the reading of a book, but by the revelation, the apocalypso of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's the model for today, that the end of the age will be a people of revelation, the spirit of truth guiding us into all truth. The helper is the spirit of truth. John 15 tells us that. The helper is the spirit of truth that will guide us into all truth. And it's not something that can be intellectually conceived. It's something that is revealed, then unpacked, un unfolded, disclosed laid bare. That's what the word apocalypso means. The laying bare, the unveiling, the disclosure of a person. And that comes by supernatural revelation. So I hope this has just been a little bit of a foretaste of the next couple of blogs where we're going to begin to address some of the arguments maybe, some of the, the defenses that some people might have or some of the obstacles and stumbling blocks that people might have to begin to believe that we're to be a people of revelation that we are going to go on the other side. 
One of the things we're getting very often is that right now we're going to do our business in the heavenly realm first and then manifest in the heavenly realm first, then manifest on the earth what is established in the heavens. Isaiah chapter 51. He puts a word in our mouth, a revelation, an oracle that comes from the Spirit of God. He covers us with the shadow of His hand. That's the anointing. That's the atmosphere of the anointing. And out of that atmosphere of the anointing, a word goes forth, a, a proclamation, a decree, a revelation. And it, it establishes the heavens. And what's established in the, in, in the heavens will be founded on the earth. Then he calls out to the Zion company, the remnant of God's people. That's who the bride of Christ is, the Zion company. This company of people that are called to a different role. I know many of us, I feel this groaning within me to understand Enoch again. I've taught on Enoch many times over the years. I'm sure many of you are aware of that. But Enoch is a type. Not only did he go back and forth and have great revelation, but he didn't even taste death before the blood of Jesus Christ. And I believe many of us are feeling this, this pull, this drawing of the Spirit. That's what Paul said, this groaning within ourselves for the adoption, the placing of a son. The word adoption is huiothesia, the placing of a son in the mature inheritance, even the redemption of our body. I begin to examine these scriptures. The glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. I, I admire the early church. We look at the book of Acts and we marvel at the things the Lord did through those people. But I believe now, if we begin to see it with spirit eyes, we're saying, okay, that's our inheritance and more. We're going to have to do that and more. Our day is not more simple. It is more difficult even than the early church. That's what the Bible teaches, that the end of the age, darkness covers the earth and deep darkness the people. Wickedness has reached a pinnacle. But in the midst of great wickedness, there will be a company of people that are illuminated with great light. And they are illuminated by having supernatural encounters. We will not achieve our mandate without the supernatural manifestation of the Spirit. Period. I'll stake my life on that. We must have the supernatural empowerment of the Spirit to go where we need to go. So Lord, I pray. I pray that you will help this company of people that are watching these blogs to see the truth. If some of the people struggled and had a difficult time seeing how this is applicable to the end of the age, I pray that illumination would be given, that they would see the scriptures in a different light, that this is to be an age of revelation. We are a prophetic people. We are eagles with wings that are spread out. We're, the flying eagle anointing has been given to a body of people. Lord, let us be caught away. Let us be raptured, if you will, on a regular basis, as was the Apostle Paul, as was John, who were our models and our prototypes. Even Daniel, Ezekiel, and these prophets of old that were caught away in the realm of the Spirit and had God encounters, and they were transformed and became a voice to their generation, an accurate prophetic voice to their generation. Let us be like that, like Samuel that our words would not fall to the ground, not because we're so, so wise in our own strength, but because we have seen something that is more real. We have seen and had an encounter with the living word that cannot fail, that word that divides asunder spirit from soul like bone from marrow, judging and discerning the very thoughts and intents of the heart. Release that to your people. In this hour, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.